Well, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. I just can't get enough of it, the Anunnaki. We're talking with Gerald Clark tonight. He's got, first of all, a Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering, and that's in Electronic Circuits and Systems. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering. He was awarded several patents for his free space optical laser communications field. And back around 1996, he was working as a telecommunications executive. Somewhere along the line, he started to investigate the tablets left by the Sumerians. He's been to Turkey, Egypt, Persia, Iraq. He's been all over the place. How did a person who has the kind of electrical background that you have and science background, computer science, how'd you end up being interested in stories like the Anunnaki? Well, I was actually approached at a conference in Boston while I was a VP of engineering at Flightpoint Communications by an interesting gentleman who represented an organization out of Turkey. And one thing led to another, and they approached us and wanted us to do some patent work with them to shore up a potential deregulated telecom market, much like what happened in Mexico. So we, we went down this path, and this was about the year 2001. Uh, while I was there, I realized I was dealing with some people who were pretty hard hitters. They're showing up in caravans and Mercedes, <laughs> and they're really Jeez. power players, and I didn't know anything about their country. So I noticed there were moths around. Uh, it, the Muslim religion was the primary religion of the country. Sure. And uh, very interesting shapes. As an, as an engineer, I, I took in note that the, the mosque had a, a dome and a spire shape that looked like kind of like a UFO and, and a rocket. And I thought, well, that's an interesting thing to have together. <laughs> but beyond that, the crescent moon and these small orbs on the top drew my attention. I thought, well, I'll go figure out at least a little bit about their culture so I won't have this ugly American syndrome next time I go over there. Yeah. And that's how it started. And while I was uh, in that space, I was reading a book by Jared Diamond. And Professor Diamond wrote this book. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And it just so happened that in that book, he mentioned a city in Turkey that gave me kind of a launching point that I could had a little nugget that I could share with. And it turned out to be the city of Pedal Hayek that was quite old. And it was old enough that it exceeded the ages of the the pyramids as, as we understood them in about 3100 BCE. And then we're talking a city that was anywhere from 9,000 to 12,000 years old. So all of a sudden, uh, I was doing business in a country that uh, seemed to be much older than what I perceived as the origins of history. Were you, were you baffled by what you were beginning to uncover? Well, I was. And I have to give you a little background. While I was at Light Point, the telecom market in San Diego started to kind of recede, melt down, if you will. And we were given indication from our venture capitalists so it was a good time to take a little hiatus. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, wow, wouldn't this be a great time after doing three startup companies of just burning it at both ends and go and read something I was really interested in. And I did notice on the History Channel, Discovery Channel, that there were ancient building sites that had structures like Baalbek, Lebanon, with trilithon stones that we couldn't lift today. So there were mysteries of the past. And I thought, well, I'll take a little downtime, and I'll research some more of those. I'll, I'm an engineer, a scientist, and it'll be fun for me. I'll write a book, maybe. <laughs> Nothing serious, right? And you did. <laughs> well, it was nine years later. But yeah. So while I was in that space and uh, in researching, I stumbled across um, Zechariah Sitchin's first book on uh, the 12th planet. Great book, wasn't it? It was a ter- tremendous book. And, and back when I was looking at this, absolutely nobody was talking about anything that he was written. He, you know, it was just fantastic stuff. And... Uh, so I took the time to read everything he had and decided, you know, I'm going to keep this myself and kind of just see if I can find physical corroborating evidence over through the years and, and just see if he had any merit because he was just such a profound scholar giving you all the references to everything he wrote. It, it was truly amazing research, John. Mm-hmm. I, I remember, too, reading the 12th Planet and the subsequent Earth Chronicles books that he had. And, right. I mean, I was just, I, I, I went nuts. I said, how can this be? And, uh, <laughs> I was like, who is this? Yeah, it's one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. Exactly. And and this, well, and that, that threw me in, and I started looking in into this. And I realized that uh, uh, this gentleman, uh, Major Henry Rollins, was in Persia about the 1890s, and he was a hobbyist archaeologist. And he was out perusing uh, some sites, and he came across the cliffs of the Histoun. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. but uh, no. it's, a, it's a structure about 1,700 foot where they've got a, a picture of this wing disc inscribed okay i've seen the picture yeah Yeah, it's 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 an interesting site i I put it in my in my book but uh through the process of him climbing up there and taking a piece of paper and rubbing it with a piece of pencil pencil so he got an etching he did and there were thousands and thousands of lines he took these back to the british museum and an interesting fellow who wasn't even trained as as a linguist and archaeologist to my to my reading and understanding took this 
and figured out from what he had written that um, he had three different languages there, and one of them was still active, and they knew how to read it. And so it essentially turned into the Mesopotamian Rosetta Stone that led us to the Tigris and Euphrates with all these buried temples along there and all the cuneiform tablets that were laying there buried in the mud. So that, so that really got me intrigued. I was like, wow, so this this might be real, what Sitchin's saying here, because there they are. They're over finding this stuff. Tell me how you used some of these influences to shape your research. Well, um, I, well, let me start back. Early In my earliest childhood, I was, I was interested in energy. I built a solar tracker in ninth grade, won a state science fair project. You were one of those kind of kids. <laughs> huh? And it turned out that uh, the Secretary of Energy, James Schlesinger, gave me a certificate. He was there. I didn't know who the guy was. Yeah. He gave me the certificate, and, and my science teacher was so excited about it. He told me, you know, that certificate will allow you to do some research in the future, probably get some grant from the government, and you can expand on this, on your research, which sure. you done. And my tracker didn't take any energy, any power to, to do it. It just used um, some expandable gases and a servo to turn toward the sun. It was pretty simple. How did you come up with that? <laughs> I, you know, I, would, uh, I think my, my father had subscribed to Popular Mechanics, and I think there was an issue laying around that was talking about solar trackers and different things like that. And I just got interested. I was, I was interested in this space from a very early, yeah. early age, energy and matter particularly. And are you still? Well, it, I did, absolutely. As I um, went along, I was sponsored by the Association of Energy Engineers in college. Uh, so it kind of kept me going along. I was working in the, the space of artificial intelligence with, a, with a, some family members that started a startup company when I left the military. And so this kind of influenced uh, my ideas about structure and function and energy, and I wrote several papers on this. Got exposed to evolutionary genetic algorithms, which I was trying to implement in hardware in, in grad school and such. So I was thinking about evolution, energy, and matter from a very early age in my life. You sure were. Yeah. You sure were. And I developed a significant love of physics while I was in graduate school and reading all of Richard Feynman's stuff. So applying physics to the real world is what we were doing at LightPoint. We were essentially using free space optics within the infrared laser to transmit like a piece of fiber through the air. So you could set up one of these, these little terminals and connect an, an Internet connection quite rapidly at very, very high rates gigabit speed rates. So uh, we, where physics met the market was what LightPoint was all about. So I didn't really go beyond applying physics to the world until I got involved in uh, structural integration. All right. Now, that, how, how did this great mind for energy just come into the Anunnaki, which is strangely well, different? Well, it started with my son, JJ. He's a, he was born with a genetic disorder called the Georgia Syndrome, and this was back in 1999. What kind of syndrome is that? Um, well, it's a genetic anomaly where you can't pre- predetermine uh, from the parents that they'll get it, so it's completely random. Um, it, it ends up being a, a deletion in the 22nd chromosome at the 11th protein marker, so they call it another name for it, it's 22Q delete. And it has about 200 symptoms, one of which, and I'll focus on that one for now, is low muscle tonus. When I watch that, his connective tissue was really loose. And so he had braces on his legs, and he could not walk even when he was five. And he had a helmet on his head to reshape it. He, he was just really, you know, his connective tissue was really loose. Was it Gravity like was having its way with him? Was okay. it like palsy, Gerald? Um, a little bit, a little bit. And it, if you looked at his leg, it looked like the connective tissue had drifted down on the front of his leg, like a sock almost. It was really, and wow. I took pictures of it when I saw this. And, and that, through that process, I got introduced to structural immigration by a, a fellow athlete. Uh, I was having trouble with my my structure. I was running, and I couldn't get off the bike and run without getting cramped. And he, he just said, well, check out structural integration. And it stuck with me, and I didn't really know what it was. But it turned out, as I looked into that, it looked like it could potentially be a solution for my kid, JJ, because this this really interesting woman named Ida Roll, she had, she had been a, a researcher in fossil lipids, a Ph.D., really advanced. I mean, she... She was uh, she was researching pioneering things when women's suffrage hadn't even come into play yet. So she and she wrote a seminal book that I listed. In my so she was way ahead of her time. She too. was way she was she was a pioneer truly. And uh, so I read that she had a kid who had polio. One of his legs was was mangled, and she was seeking a solution to get that kid so he could walk. Same issue I had. I was like, wow, I get that. So and, and she went all over the world. I mean, I don't think she left any stone unturned. And the things she discovered about the human body and how to change it led me, believe it or not, to the Anunnaki. It, it turned out that once I got um, a little more information on structural integration, this raw Ida Rolf story, I thought, well, i got to go figure out how to do this for my kid. So I had it done to me first as an athlete. Well, let's see what it does. Does it work? It was profound, really profound. I mean, the 
energy changes and the structural changes I got, and it's all photographs you can see before I'm led me to think, you know, this is something I want to do for my boy. So I left sure. engineering, took a very securitous route to learn uh, to be a structural integrator, and that landed me in Kauai, Hawaii, with Ida Rolf's very first teacher, Emmett Hutchins. And he was mystical. This guy had been doing this work for 35 years when I was there, and he's in his 70s, and he's still doing the work now. Were you hopeful this was going to work? Well, it, had wor- it was working for me, yeah. and I realized if I could figure out what they did, I could, make, I could do this for my kid. Yeah. So I was I, I had listen I had no knowledge of the anatomy of my body I had to go to some courses before that to learn anatomy and physiology before I could even participate in this in this domain I had some downtime since telecom was, was melting down and, and I was in a financial position where I could do this but I got there and I was the only engineer most of the other people in the class were body workers you know massage therapists and pe- people like that were that were progressing in their knowledge relative to the body so while I was there I just so happened. Emmett Hutchins was the very first person I'd ever shared my knowledge about the Anunnaki with. So we traded, we, you know, and I respected him, and he respected me, and I felt like I wasn't, maybe I wasn't crazy. Now, had you, had you started your research into the Anunnaki at that point? Well, by that point, I'd read most of Sitchin's work, okay. but I wasn't talking about it. But you weren't researching. Anyone. Well, I'd read it, but I wasn't actually, you know, it was a theory to me at that point, and I was corroborating. You know, I found that there were those physical gold mines that were owned by the Anglo-American Mining Corporation in Africa along the Zambezi River, just yeah. like the Sumerian account says. And there were a few other uh, things that, that came up, you know, the, the structure of some of the cities that Sitchin talked about from a pilot standpoint and how they were arrayed in various radii so that there was an approach blast to Sapar, which he called the spaceport. Well, I've read VOR approach blades as a pilot for years. So when I looked at it, I was like, yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. So... Um, so it was, it was very interesting. So while I'm having this discussion with this very mystical guy who's, who's Ira Rolf's very first teacher, and turns out he also said something that surprised me as well, and that he was experimenting with something he'd read about in a colloidal solution of gold and how it was affecting his energy and, and his consciousness and such. And, right. and these were very private conversations just between he and I. And, and affecting it in a good way, right? Well, in a good way. And, yeah. and as I was leaving the island, he said something absolutely profound to me that just still sticks me today. He said, I don't know if I would want to live forever. One thing led to another. And as I researched further, I actually read Lawrence Gardner's book and, and really figured out what the Starfire gold was that he was talking about. Oh, my about. God. And, and, you know, he's passed away. Sad story. Oh, yeah. Well, I wanted to, yeah. He, what a wonderful author. Yeah. yeah. That's too bad. But a profound author. I recommend everybody read his book, Genesis, The Grail King. So you're seeing this connection between the well, gold yeah, and all exactly. that. Exactly. So I'm well, as I'm in Hawaii and getting this structural crazy body work to learn how to teach it and do it to my kid, I'm having profound changes in my energy and sensation of the sunlight, water, everything, colors brighter. I was like, what's going on here? And as part of the coursework, we were required to write a graduation paper to explain our experience of structural integration. Well, the topic I chose as an engineer was Structure is function and energy. So in that paper, I derived an equation that shows how the human energy body is related to gravity, wavelength, frequency, and weight, all things we can measure. So all of a sudden, I realized, well, I really stumbled on something interesting here. And it seemed to be the Anunnaki were using star for our goal to prolong their life and affect their energy bodies. So I wanted to quantize that, and then I did, and I put that in the book. It's, it's really a fascinating it, What Was it powdered gold or liquid? Well, uh, if you read David Hudson's uh, patent, which he filed, and this is mentioned in Lawrence Gardner's book, he filed a patent it's on Army's gold. You can go read it. It turns out that they were using a simulated process of annealing, smelting the gold to various temperatures, and if you know anything about how electrons go from their valence shell to an outer shell, or from their inner shell to a valence shell, and you add energy, it's very similar to with a monoatomic element like gold. So you're heating it up, adding something to it. Turns out they're adding antimony, that's the secret element. And then when they bring it back down in temperature at various rates, it, turn, it turns into a white powder with a large mass of it missing. Okay. And they ingest that. Well, that, that was the interesting part. So you go to ancient history and look at uh, when Moses, in, in the Exodus account, was at the base of Mount Sarabit el Kitim, which is Mount Sinai, named after Nanar Sin, the wilderness of Sin, the moon god. Anyway, he, uh, he got there, and, of course, there, were, there was smoke coming out of the top. Uh, it turns out, it would make a long story short, he goes up there. That's Hathor's temple. We have found it. We found lots of starfire gold underneath one of the, one of the stones in the floor, and it's been analyzed to determine exactly what that was. So it was this, this quest 
to learn a little bit more about what the Anunnaki did with the gold mm -hmm. to help your son. Now, did you ever end up treating your son with this? Well, I did go and complete my structural integration uh, training. I uh, as a member of the International Association of Structural Integrators for seven years. I ran my own practice. I had no idea I was going to end up in full-time business. And I saw hundreds of clients and then shared Ida Roth's work with them, including my wonderful wife, who, who I dedicated my book to and trained her to do it as well. So, um, yeah, it's absolutely astounding work. It's not, I don't think there's any coincidence that I did it for seven years. I know. Gerald, did you use it on your son? Absolutely. So within six months of applying it to his leg, before and after pictures, plumb bob, grid chart, you know, like an engineer I do, he, he was standing up straight, no braces. Amazing. Jumping on a trampoline higher than any, anyone could imagine, and it was more balanced than any kid in his class. And how was he now? The same. Very limber, too. So you're, you're saying he's healed? Well, from a structure standpoint, we've gotten a tremendous amount of healing. Is he, is he completely healed? No, I need to spend a lot more time with him. Is he still uh, ingesting powdered gold, or? Oh well, JJ isn't not at all. I was, this was uh, this was uh, my my contact in Hawaii. And speaking of that, I'll I'll just share with you. Um, it is available. You can buy it. Um, it's expensive, um, isn't it? Yeah, it's about one hundred twenty dollars for a small vial, and I've only ever tried it twice. And uh, my friend said I was really righteous and hard to be around when I was like that. So I, does, I, I, does it float? Anyway. <laughs> with, does it float with the price of gold? Uh, it seems to. It seems to. Yeah. Now they're using other heavy metals, for like uh, platinum and silver, and other ones to do these colloidal solutions. And I have no scientific knowledge. All right, Gerald. When we come back, I want to get your take then on the Anunnaki, the Genesis account, and see how all of that ties right in. Gerald Clark with us, the Anunnaki of Nibiru, and welcome back to Coast to Coast with Gerald Clark as we talk about his research work, the Anunnaki of Nibiru. Gerald, there are some out there who think that Zechariah Sitchin was wrong in his interpretation of those tablets. Uh, your thoughts? Um, actually, it depends on which tablet you want to start with. There's three very, very important ones that I like to focus on. And actually, Zechariah pointed us to these ones as well as his source. And one of them was the Atrahasis. The second one was the Enuma Elish. And the third one was the Epic of Gilgamesh. And why, why are those important? Well, the Atrahasis account turns out to be Atrahasis is a, is a very important name. And before we go into the Sumerian version, I want to back up to the Genesis account. Um, in that, in our account in Genesis, right in the beginning, it says the Lord said, "Let, let us make man in our image, our image, our likeness." So that that concern about the who is the plural in our was always a, bit, a focal point of, well, well who, are, who are these people? Who are, there's more one. Then they mentioned the Nephilim and, and so on and so forth. And this was a, a basis for many people to launch a, a research into ancient, ancient astronauts. Sure. Well, it sounds like if you look at Genesis, only from the perspective of ETs coming down here, it fits like a T. Well, it especially fits like a T if you know which one uh, had his way in shaping it into a monotheistic account. Good old Enki. Well, that would be Enlil. Or Enlil. Yeah, so it, speaking of those names, in the Genesis account from the Sumerians, and in particular the Atrahasis, in that account it introduces us to the, the players that are on the Anunnaki Council. So there was an actual council of 12 people who ran things, and their the top council member was Anu. His next member in charge was Enlil, whose rank was 50. And Enki was the next one, and his rank was 40. And those are the three key players in the true Genesis account. Not uh, not to leave out the female aspect, who was Nin Hartzog or Isis, who participated with Enki. I've wondered, Gerald, if these people, these the Anunnaki, if they were cast castaways from their own planet, or was this something more organized? Well, in my book, I, I put together a, a little prehistory of Nibiru, which, which Zechariah Sitchin had researched himself. And it's in one of his very, very... Um, hidden away timelines of the history of the uh, history of the Anunnaki, and, and in that timeline, he mentions the prehistory on Nibiru about 450,000 years ago when Anu ended up as king. Um, he ended up as king by rest, resting away from an unjust ruler, Alalu, who was exiled. He left, came to Earth, discovered gold as an amends to try to get back in good with the Anunnaki hierarchy on Nibiru. He stated that uh, this gold could heal their ailing atmosphere, which, when it came in close. Perigee with mm -hmm. the sun being so far out past Pluto, according to Harrington, that uh, it was damaging their atmosphere. So Anu dispatched his firstborn son, Enki, landed in the Persian Gulf, according to the account, 
was supposed to be able to mine gold there to send it back to Nibiru. Couldn't get it fast enough after setting up the city of Ridu, which, which we found. In 1973, the University of Chicago uh, published pictures of the city of Ridu when they found it. And, uh, and from there, uh, basically, their mission was to get gold how, however they needed to. And it, and it landed them in South Africa along the Zambezi River where they, instead of getting it out of the ocean, they, they figured mining it was going to be much quicker. And I assume they had the kind of technology to spot from space where, mm-hmm. the, where the gold might be on this planet. Right. Well, we, exactly. We use spectroscopy now to see what a planet is composed of. Right. Uh, now, and I'm sure that given they were 50,000 years at least ahead of us, uh, that they were able to do that as well. And one, one thing, that, without getting too far off track, is there is a Sumerian king's list that documents each of the rulers from, from that region, all the way back to the Genesis account when they say that they set up the first kingship in Aridu. So, you know, there's, so there's, some, there's some good Genesis account data. And when you finally realize that the, the Hebrew scholars that were taken captive in Babylon in about 330 BCE saw these Sumerian tablets for the very first time, which predated their records by thousands of years. And in order, to, and, and I put this in my book, and, and clearly what they've done in the, in the Torah is to take those Sumerian documents in the flood story, the creation account, which are in infinite Sumerian detail. No, no, the, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, Gerald, the, the Sumerians were earthlings, right? Yes. And yes. at what point did they develop after the Anunnaki, let's say, left? Well, it, it actually it started much earlier than that, because if you go to the Atrahasis account, which, which Sitchin pointed us to, in there there's a clear account where the Gigi miners that had been taken down to mine the gold, which they brought from Nibiru, mutinied under Enwell's command. Okay. So They didn't want to do that. They didn't no. want to work. <laughs> well, they'd been here for many shars, according to the record, and this is in the first tablet of the Atrahasis. And, and so one of the solutions was brought up to, well, let's, let's uh, potentially look at these Neanderthals that are roaming the steppes of Africa. Okay. And, jumpstart them to a primitive worker that could be useful to us. And this was a really, really um, a heavy topic that Enki pondered over whether he should do this, because apparently slavery was against the law in the guru. Well, and hence, the law. So, and hence came Adam and Eve that way, right? Well, exactly. So in their account, Enki, uh, with the council's approval, and in Hartzog, in their house of Shimti in Africa, which was his domain, did genetic experiments to come up with a primitive worker that could follow their commands and mine the gold and relieve the uh, GG miners. And it's in the account, and that's exactly what they did. Did the worker look like we look now? And well, exactly. Do, exactly. It, it, One of the really interesting parts, this brings up this whole concept of the creation versus evolution debate. What, what did they look like? Well, according to them, Enki took his genetic material, mixed it with a Neanderthal, which he recognized was a viable species that was similar that had evolved on their planet. This was kind of the key. Apparently in the Enuma Ilish, which was their creation account, seeds of their planet were dispersed on our planet with a collision account. And it's kind of like a panspermia. Right. So anyway, he recognized this life form, and he modified it, putting his mark on it. Okay, so, so, the, so the DNA that we have is hybrid Anunnaki and probably the original DNA from the creator of all which they also alluded to as a uh, being that they had an encounter on their planet. Do we look like them? We do look like them. That's what I thought. Yeah, exactly like them. Okay. But it does appear that they were taller than we were, but we do look like them. They were the giants of old. Yeah, well, they, they were shown to be approximately 12 feet tall when they were sitting in some of the cuneiform seals. I, I guess they didn't want to create workers that could rival or attack them. Well, that's the whole thing. And so in the account... Uh, they eventually create this Adapa. Um, he wasn't able to procreate. They, they finally decide that they're not able to replicate them the way they were fast enough to meet the labor requirements. They allowed them to procreate. This is where Enki's firstborn son, <clears> or <throat> secondborn son, Ningshida Thoth, got involved. He was a premier scientist. His symbol was the Caduceus. And he got involved, upgraded their DNA, took them up to the Garden of Eden, which was in Aridu. And Enko, Enki and Enlil were there in the garden, in the, in the Genesis account, when they were studying them to determine the effects of this DNA upgrade so that they could procreate. How long do you think it took to create an Adam and Eve? I mean, did they go through full term and, you know, were they 20 years old? Or, or was this an instant genetic manipulation and there they were hanging inside of a test tube somewhere? Well, they, kind of, they were kind of spawned in vitro because Nin Hartzog carried the, the baby to full birth. It, no, it was a full-term baby, and 
nine months, nine months. Born just like a baby. And, and they, they describe in their documents having a, a great time seeing how the babies were growing much quicker on this planet than they were on theirs based on the short orbital cycles of our planet, Earth around the sun. So it took them a lot longer to mature on the Buru than it did on the Earth. I know, but I mean, in terms of growth here of these genetically altered humans, mm-hmm. did they grow in real time or were they able to speed it up so a 20-year-old got to his point in two years, let's say. Well, it did not look to me like they sped it up. As a matter of fact, one of the real interesting points I was watching in this whole thing was, okay, so they created us as a slave, and they messed with our DNA. What capabilities do we have and what are our limits? They clearly stated we were given intelligence and a limited life of 120 years, not to be exceeded. So in my book, well, I they got uh, really close to that, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, there's one woman who actually ended up being 122 years and 164 days old. She was a French woman. Well, now, in the Bible, they talk about uh, you know, Methuselah, you know, 900 years, mm-hmm. and things like Were those Anunnaki? Well, if you go back to the Sumerian king's list and those original pure Nibirian genotypes, they apparently have the ability to prolong their life indefinitely. And some of them at the very high levels that were ingesting starfire gold were doing just that. And uh, we've discovered uh, just recently in 2009, a couple of scientists were issued a Nobel Prize for their research into telomeres and longevity. And apparently the Starfire Gold is directly related to that. How did they leave, Gerald? Is there, are there any accounts on how and why they just left? Well, from the, from the Wars and Gods and Men written by Sitchin, it looked like they got into some significant skirmishes over control of their, quote, bond heaven earth, which is their space facilities. With each other? With each other. And this was the, and I, and I termed them the Enlilites and the Enkiites. So you had Enlil and Enki and their offspring. And they were constantly at war with each other pretty much like the Hatfields and McCoys. And it's still going on to this day, by the way. Here? Yes. Okay, so they had this battle, this war. Did they use atomic oh, weapons? Well, yeah. So according to the nurse of Enlil's son, she got an atomic weapon, used it against the Sapar spaceport because he could not fight off the onslaught of Marduk, who was Enki's first son, who was based in Babylon. So once this nuclear cloud contaminated the Mesopotamian region, Apparently, the only city that was spared based on the wind flow from west to southeast was Babylon. And Enki and Enlil and Anu on the council, they took that as a sign that Marduk was destined to be the new ruler on, on the earth. And he ended up taking over the council position as rank 50 in about 2000 BCE. When we hear the biblical accounts of cities demolished, Sodom and Gomorrah, mm-hmm. do you think that was the offshoot of the atomic war? Well, absolutely it was. This yeah. was the Enkiites going at the Enlilites, if you will. Well, so, and because they told the wife, I, you know, not, don't remember all my biblical stuff, but right. don't well, turn around. And... Was, the, was the brother of... Um, who was the wife? Abram. And who... that was, uh, you're talking about Sarah? Yeah, she was the one who was told, don't turn around and look. Oh, yeah. Or well, you'll turn into salt. That's a very interesting account in and of itself, where the nuclear account goes, it looks like Babylon was nuked. Um, Marduk was building a spaceport. He wasn't building some crazy tower. He was building a space function that, that violated Enlil's right to command up in the Sinai. So they took that out. Yeah, so they wiped that out. And apparently the Sodom and Gomorrah account is a complete lie. Um, the, the people there were obvious, were, according to the real account, quite evolved. And, and their account with, and holding hot lot captive means that they were Enkiites. Well, let, was, let's, he, wait, <laughs> let's wait two things, Gerald. One, the Anunnaki did all this. Or two... We had advanced civilizations back a long, long time ago, and they had this capability. Which one do you weigh? Well, according to Paul Hellier, who's testifying in front of Congress, he says there were up to 20 alien species operating for thousands of years. So were they just from Nibiru? Maybe not. The only reason I focused on the Anunnaki was because it looked like they were the ones that were our genetic modifiers. And they may have been the first ones. Yeah, so, you know. But, but there, I believe there are other ones, and he mentions them from Zeta Reticuli, the Pleiades, a whole bunch okay, of them. In so it. they had this disastrous war. Mm-hmm. What happens? So at that point, Babylon hangs on, but everybody else starts heading east. And that's kind of the place where the Anunnaki Council of Twelve turned into the Greek pantheon at Baalbek, Lebanon. Now that's so, interesting. Yeah, so, the, there you're, so, the, so Zeus is Enlil, like I put on the back of the book. Okay. And Anki is Poseidon. So Poseidon and Zeus, you know, it's, it's great mythical fun from Marvel Economics, but this, this was real stuff. These were real beings. And they, and they represented uh, creation and destruction, just like Zoroastrian religion specified they did. Because the, the mythology, when you really look at it, mm-hmm. 
and then you try to apply it to, you know, real-life ETs, it does all fit, doesn't it? It does. So all of a sudden, where my head started spinning was when I was researching the city of Ur, where one of the lamentations of Ur was when the people were crying out to their local deity, Enlil, about the destruction of the place. It happened three times. Well, in the third dynasty of Ur and its destruction, they mentioned Enlil's name in this tablet, but they also call him Yahweh. So all of a sudden, wow, you find out the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was an ancient Anunnaki astronaut living in the city of Ur. Now you're going to really get some people's <laughs> ire up. So are you yeah, saying... Uh, yes, I am I, saying I, Well, I don't think you're saying there is no God. I haven't heard that come out of you. No, according to... Well, I, I don't, this may be an offshoot a little bit. Enki did not view himself as God. He viewed himself as a scientist and a genetic manipulator, just like we have in labs all over the country today. But he did mention in his lost book of Enki and several other accounts where they had encounters with the creator of all. That's what they called him. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So now, creation and evolution, that debate, all of a sudden, evolution is a real thing. But if you come in and you interrupt it with a genetic modification, now you've got a creation account that goes with that evolution. That's right. They they're not mutually exclusive. That's right. And some of the evidence, let's talk about some of the evidence okay. for a moment, Gerald. Mm-hmm. One thing that fascinates me is in Egypt, Abydos. Mm. That, that tablet, how big is that thing? It's pretty good size, isn't it's it? It's crazy. It, it, yeah, you're, I think you're referring to the uh, evidence of the H-64 Apache. Yes. The, uh, the Looks like a helicopter or a submarine. Well, being a, a helicopter pilot in the Army, uh, that really resonated with me as well. And it, I it, listed that in my book. It's clearly a helicopter, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. I, well, listen, in the uh, Mahabharata, in the Indian documents, they clearly talk about the manas and flying sh- ships yep. battling each other. And you go into the wars of gods and men where Horus and uh, Seth were in aircraft, battling each other, firing missiles. So is yeah. this the battle of the Anunnaki that you were just talking about? Well, yeah, they had multiple ones, multiple battles. And in so the, Christian's premier book, The War of Gods and Men, he, he details several of them. Well, no wonder we're like them. We're a warring, we're <laughs> exactly. a warring group of people. We, exactly. We got, we got many of our attributes from them. So it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that we're just like them. But this, the, how old is that tablet in Abydos? I believe that one is... Thousands Easily of before 3800 BCE. Easy. Was, you know, it's like 5,800 years old. I mean, that's it's dramatic. It's amazing, yeah. Well, they found little artifacts like that all around the world that don't seem to jive well with the with the level of knowledge that they had. You know, I was working up at Cal IT2 at UCSD here in San Diego, and I ran into some guys from the, the Smithsonian Channel that were down uh, doing a presentation. They had a really nice presentation room, and they were talking about the DNA studies that they had sponsored and that you could sign up for them. And it was really, really interesting. And it turns out that uh, there were two studies to find out who our original male and female were, our original Adam and Eve. And they did it with genetics. Are you aware of this? Yes. Okay. So I'll, 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 I'll abbreviate. Yes. So you have the genetic Eve study where they were looking for the mitochondrial DNA. And they led that back to the Zambezi River pretty much 200,000 years ago. And then the genetic Adam study, same thing. Well, it turns out that that's co- that location is coincident with where these Anunnaki gold mines were. I want to talk with you about DNA next hour, Gerald, when we come back, and genetics and eternal life and what they're doing. But why did they leave, Gerald? Why did they Why did they leave? Think about that. Gerald's website, of course, doesn't have one, but he's got a book. It's called The Anunnaki of Nibiru, Mankind's Forgotten Creators and Slavers, Saviors, and Hidden Architects of the New World Order, which we'll also talk about that. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Gerald Clark with us. Gerald, let's talk a little bit about the genetics and the DNA work that they did. Did they have full-scale laboratories? Did they do this in their craft? <laughs> what did I they do? Guess. Well, uh, according to the account, it looked like um, Enki and Nin Herzog had a genetics lab in Africa. They called it the House of Shimti. So that's, that's the, probably the extent I know about their facilities. But it does look like they went through many iterations. They didn't get it right the first time. Oh, can you imagine? Well, yeah, it looked like they started with trying to use animal DNA initially, and they ended up with all kinds of, quote-unquote, chimeras, I guess, that didn't quite work out. And finally, as a last result, it looks like they took their DNA and decided, well, this is probably the best solution we have to put put our mark on them because then we can have control over how we deal with our slaves. Let's let's face it, they they were designed as slaves. Is it possible? I don't know why I thought about this, but that the Yeti, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, might have been an offshoot of one of their failed experiments? Oh, it's very possible. Uh, And a lot of other strange creatures that they're discovering. 
Well, so so they genetically did their thing, and they created these creatures out of what you thought are Neanderthals that were here, mm-hmm. and they started working. Now, somewhere along the line, they wanted to eradicate them, right? Right, and this is this is in the Atrahasis account, and this is where, when you read this, you ought to get quite angry seeing what was done to the primitive workers. And this was all initiated by Enlil in the in the tablets. And, it's, and I put it in my book so people have the source material. And sure. this. Uh, started out with uh, introducing some strange disease, which he called the Faku disease, and then it became Sarupu disease, and then starvation, and finally it ended up um, asking his brother to bring a flood to wipe the rest of them out. Pretty genocidal, in my opinion. Like the, the, the flood of Noah? Exactly. And actually, Atrahasis is another name for Zia Sudra, who is Noah. Who uh, who was yeah. Noah? Was Noah yeah. an Anunnaki, or was he one of us? Well, <laughs> well it's very interesting. I hope he was you read one in the Lost Book of Enoch, the birth account of Noah is very, very <laughs> extravagant. It's very strange, too. And it sends Methuselah and, his, and Lamech both running for the hills, trying to figure out what just happened to them. Turns out that it looks like, and this is according to Sitchin's work, um, Batanesh, who was uh, Lamech's wife, was lured to Sharupak, Noah's city. He was the king of Sharupak, where she actually was impregnated by Enki himself. So Atrahasis was Enki's son, but he was, but he was the son of a, a woman who was one of the primitive workers and, and a deity from Nibiru. So he wasn't full blood, full blooded. He was fifty percent, according to the account, in the Il Epic of Gilgamesh. Fifty percent. Because Gilgamesh sought him out to try to figure out how he ended up getting eternal life. Okay, so why did they leave, assuming they did? Uh, why did they leave? Yeah, they're gone, right? Well, not all of them, no, they weren't. Um, several of them in the account decided to stay, and they were given a, they, an emissary was sent by Anu to tell them that we've got some bad news for you. <laughs> and well, imagine getting this news that you've been an ancient astronaut mining gold somewhere else. Right. Those short solar cycles on Earth, having, they, having been here so long, had affected their constructs of their bodies such that if they went back to Nibiru, they would be suffering immeasurably. Don't come. And Enlil responded, wow, we've been, we've been the ones enslaved on a remote planet because of the short cycles of the planet and how long we've been here. So uh, it was causing rapid aging, according to the records. And Nin Herzog, who was their medical officer, and Keith's half-sister, was in charge of trying to prolong their lives. Gerald, you know, when you look at history, Mm-hmm. And and you look at what's happening. We got a lot of people who are, are upset because they think this is a slap in religion's face. How do you answer that? Well, um, I would say that there were three players that have set up religion, and and I'm, I'm not I'm not interested in slapping any religion. I'm only interested oh, in the truth. That. So here's a council member who's called Yahweh Enlil, who has brothers and sisters that are on this council also, and they're all venerated as gods in the temples in Mesopotamia. So we know who they are. We know that in the Atrahes account, for instance, we know who Allah is. It was Enlil's son, Nanar Sin. His, his symbol was the crescent moon. Remember I told you I was in Turkey he was looking at these yeah. symbols? Well, it turns out that Nanar Sin is Enlil's son, and he's the one that led the Ajiji in the revolution to burn their tools and revolt and say, we want relief. So when Genesis was put together, when it was written as the Bible, mm-hmm. they based it on what they knew from what? Word of well, mouth? No, uh, from, from what, what I understand. Were they eyewitnesses? This is in the historical record we're, we're under Barathus and such who put together the Sumerian Kings list. The, the Hebrews were, you realize, Jerusalem and Babylon were at war all the time. Well, because there's a genetic reason for that. Babylon's chief deity was Marduk, and, and Enlil was on the other side. Had, having been assigned the Levantine. So all of uh, Israel and, and that area, and actually all of Mesopotamia, ended up under Enlil's rule. And Enki was given Africa. And the Sinai Peninsula belonged to the Anunnaki themselves. So that's where the space facilities were. You know, I'm just amazed at the scientific approach to this mm-hmm. and how they did this. But, you know, they, they were creating slave labor, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, you, you look at this and go, well, our current lab researchers can alter DNA and create things, Dolly the Sheep, and all these other things that are going on. <laughs> not, not, not to even discuss the ethical ramifications of it, but uh, they were doing that. And, uh, and it's pretty clear that scientists have identified our DNA as being 95% junk. Now, do you believe that? But, you know, if that's true, <laughs> sounds like an awful lot of waste. Mm, well, this is where some of my research in college led me to believe that nature doesn't produce junk. 
like that. So, so, so speaking of genetics, occasionally in our society you'll see an anomaly where somebody's got extreme capabilities of some sort or another. And it could be that the inactivated DNA, which was a way of enslaving us, they didn't give us their full features, clearly. I mean, we were designed for to do a specific function. But the really interesting part, George, is Enki struggled with this, is the, the idea of fate and destiny, whether you know he had enslaved the species that was evolving that eventually was going to become just a sentient being just like they were. And so he left that capability in those beings so that they could continue that. And as a matter of fact, in the uh, Darhesis account, there were multiple instances of these annihilation attempts of mankind where Enki interceded on their behalf and, and, and tried to mitigate and protect his creation. Did they ever describe what kind of craft they had? In any of the tablets? In the in the tablets, and I'm only focusing on the Atrahasis, the Numa Elish, and the Epic of Gilgamesh. They don't go into infinite detail. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, they do talk about Gilgamesh going up to Baalbek, Lebanon, where it was a space facility. And they were using uh, rockets, apparently, to take off and land. Because they, they were describing you know, the fiery trails that were they're leaving. So, so they were they did have rocket technology, but they also appeared to have Anana had a blackbird, and so did Ninurta. But they, they had some sort of winged disc. You can take that for what it is, but uh, in my interpretation, it's no different than the, the disks that we're seeing all over this planet, and we call them UFOs. Well, I think they have been identified. They were craft of the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki were, you said, 12 feet tall, much bigger than we were. Tell me about the planet Nibiru. Hmm. What's so special about that planet? Why well, haven't astronomers found it? Well, they actually have, George. In 1983, after reading all of Sitchin's work, Dr. Harrington, who worked at the Naval Observatory, was in charge of an IRAS program, an infrared astrological uh, uh, probe, where they could image uh, infrared. And, and, and the, the issue was they knew that there was something out beyond Pluto that was perturbing planetary alignments relative to the solar ecliptic, and they wanted to know what it was. And Harrington led this research and found a brown dwarf in the area that Sitchin had indicated. They actually met, talked about it, and Harrington, Harrington, in my book, I give you the reference, they, he agreed that it was Nibiru, it's, without question. And what, then then there was an article published shortly thereafter where they announced this. Um, it got some play, and then it was kind of withdrawn. Nobody talked about it. But it was actually in, a, in the paper they announced it. What about the heat source for this planet? I mean, how can well, it be so far away from our sun? Well, it looks like from uh, Richard Hoagland's work in torsion field effect physics, as you have a planet spinning in a molten metal core that certain forces can be applied that cause it to not only send out energy out of the north and south pole of the planet, but it, it heats up the inside. So they were geothermally heated, according to uh, all their accounts. And they were very sensitive to light. A lot of their depictions and, and, and discussions have to do with very very sensitive to, to radiation. <laughs> well, I was going to say, did they, yeah. did they live in darkness? Well, being out beyond Pluto and getting the solar radiation from our sun, they, they weren't it couldn't have been very warm, first of all. So they weren't in the optical zone like the Earth is relative to where our water doesn't vaporize and it's warm enough where you don't, you know, cook to death. So, but but now imagine the, the problem that they had throughout in apogee beyond Pluto in a 3,600 retrograde orbit, meaning you've got a solar, you've got an observatory that gets to see all the planets if you're going the opposite direction. So they were studying our solar system for a long time. Well, when they got close into perigee, Imagine the intensity of the solar radiation that it would do to their atmosphere when they got you know, real close and then going out. So I could see that being a significant problem. And that was what they were focused on, was repairing their atmosphere by ionizing gold and putting in there. Gold's a wonderful radiation. Sure. So you, you think that they are still part of our solar system. They're out there somewhere. Well, yeah, you, we, we kind of left off, are they here? Everybody wants to know, are they here? They're absolutely still here. Absolutely. And when their symbol, symbols relate to various countries and governments, they haven't hidden their namesakes or who they are. For instance, in Persia, way back when, when Zoroastrian religion was, was active, there, they had taken all the Anunnaki gods and summarized them into two, Angramayu and Ahura Mazda. Well, Angramayu was, was the great destroyer, and Ahura Mazda was Anki, who was shown on the, on the cliffs of Behistun in his flying disc over Darius being venerated. So we know who they were. It is dramatic. I mean, it's, dramatic. It's, it is really one of the greatest Hard to swallow, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's, there's clear evidence. But now let's, let's i got to bring up the question again about God. I was raised Catholic. Good, okay. You know, I read the Bible, read mm -hmm. Genesis, um, 
fascinated by it, but always, even as a little boy, Gerald, I always questioned the fallen angels and the other stories. Yeah, and I want to preface this. I believe in a higher power. It's mm-hmm. it's out there. I, I think this higher power created the Anunnaki. I, mean, I agree. It, it, I, it, I think this higher power, we can call it the creator of all, I think it yeah. created the seeds of all life. I, I, I think so, too. Mm-hmm. But on one hand, it's exciting to hear the stories of the Sumerians, but it's also a little disappointing in that if the other stuff is incorrect, like the angels and things like that. Well, uh, I don't think they all could be categorized as fallen angels. The members on the council were highly ethical, and they referred to them as the righteous ones from the rocket ship. I mean, they, they were they were all about integrity. So, yes, the Ajiji that were the, the workers that they brought with them appeared to be kind of at a lower level consciousness than the Elohim that were mentioned. So the Anunnaki uh, themselves, yes, they were warring, but they usually had good reasons when they were going at each other, you know, violation of turf and, and their contractual violations, you know, they had justifiable reasons. There was something that uh, that I wanted to share with you, because I read some of the stuff that you had written, George, and you had a clear interest in what Edward Case was all about. Yes. And I, I, I did a little research right before I got on the show here to find something that would tie in where Edward Case was relative to this stuff, and I'm not sure it's the right time, but... Uh, but he said, for instance, and we're, now we're talking about these Anunnaki beings, one of them's name was Ningshida, which was Enki's son. He was known as Thoth to the, to the Egyptians and Hermes to the Greeks. Okay? Well, in Casey's writing, he actually said something very profound that I think I wanted to share with you. All right. And he was the one that carried the caduceus, the staff that represented energy and matter. And mm-hmm. I, I really hope we get a chance to talk about that. But anyway, the staff carried by God Mercury according to Edward Case, was an incarnate, and he specifically said that Enoch, Mercury, and Thoth were, was an incarnation of the Word. Explain. Well, if you go back to uh, the, the Bible reference to Jesus in John 1 14, the Word became flesh, mm-hmm. right? So, this, so he's saying very specifically, and he's got five different instances here uh, from the, the Case Institute, where he's He's talking about energy and matter and how his vision of who this creator of all was and how it was designed into these primitive workers so that we have an experience of it. And the key to it to him was this purveyor, which also was corroborated by Anu, that Thoth was mankind's teacher, and he was the incarnation of the Word. Where does the devil come? Well, if we go back to the pre-Christian religion in Angra, mind you, in Zoroastrianism, he was the great destroyer. That was Enlil. So and I'll just lay it out there, AKA list for Enlil, Yahweh, El Shaddai, Yehovah, all the same being. Yeah. So you have to understand these guys lived a very, very long time. And they're perpetuating their life. So on the back of my book, I've got a table to show what their names were in various cultures. What about Buddha? Well, yeah, Buddha actually was covered by a really good researcher named Rob Solarian. He's got a god table in his book, Isis, Osiris, and Planet X, that covers Buddha and all the Asian and the Nordic religions and how these guys migrated. I kind of just focused on where the Westerners were uh, focused, which was, you know, Rome and Greece, because that's where we're taught in school, where our history begins. And, and, and Edward Case is the one that describes to us, he talks about the endocrine glands and the chakras and where energy meets matter. And this has to do with genetics as well. Can we expect the Anunnaki to come back again? What would you say if they're already here? I they're would, already... I'd say, behind. well, in as much as they look like us, how would we know? Well, that's a very good question, because uh, according to Paul Hellier, when they, when they mingle among us, they generally like to wear sunglasses, and they're very comfortable doing that, going in and out of casinos in Las Vegas. So they love Vegas. That's strange. No, he, that's what he said in his video. Do they win? Uh, I guess it depends on the house odds. Yeah. Why haven't we found other alternative energy sources yet to use? Oh, well, we have. It's just a matter of the, the, the powers that be that are focused on economics, allowing them to be rolled out in the market. How many battery companies have been put out of business by General Motors and the likes because they didn't want the electric vehicle out? There's been there's been several. There's, there was a whole community in Michigan when I was young reading popular mechanics that it was experimenting with hydrogen. You know, and it's, it's prolific, and anywhere you've got oceans, you can get hydrogen out of it and run things off of it. So there are lots of alternative ways to, to do 
but then Tesla was was one of them. He was shut down as well. But I've, I've been watching and researching uh, using Tesla technology. It's very very simple to do for yourself if you have any electrical experience whatsoever. A variable capacitor, a copper bowl, and and uh, some batteries and a charge controller, and you can do it straight up. All right, well, stay with us, Gerald. Going to come back and talk with you about the new world order and how that ties into all of this. Gerald Clark, our guest, the book, The Anunnaki of Nibiru. Gerald, let's spend a little time talking about the New World Order, and then we'll get into your energy stories. But how, right. how, how does the New World Order, in your opinion, fit into all this? Well, it goes all the way back to the Anunnaki Council of 12. If you look at the composition of the council, generally the rank of 50 was the rank that was highest on Earth, and there was a ping-pong going back and forth. Uh, to determine whether it was an Enolite or an Enkiite that was sitting in that seat. Now, how did they determine whose turn it was? Well, that's where the zodiac came in. So the zodiacal houses were what they used to establish the term limits, if you will, and who was going to be a ruler. So, um, so just recently, speaking of that, we just went out of the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius. So if you know that every 72 years you get a one-degree processional flip in the in the equinox among the and the zodiacal houses that you know, and uh, so if that's the case in 30 degrees per house, you've got about 2,000 years, a little over 2,000 years for each one of them to rule if they each got a zodiacal house. Okay, so we know who was in that council in 2000 BCE. It was Marduk. He, his rule was interrupted by the Great Flood, or one, one of the floods. <laughs> yeah, but he knew that was coming. Yeah, yeah. So, but he only ended up ruling for a thousand years, and he was supposed to get. Oh, that's all. Zodiac, he was always he was supposed to get a full zodiacal house. Just a thou? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Well, his yeah, next brother is Ningshita Thoth, Hermes, the one that Case is talking about, the incarnation of the word, i.e., Jesus. Okay. Anyway, um, so when the zodiacal house changes, you expect some change. Now, now, the, how does how does this all time? I'll tie something in really crazy for you here. I was looking at the at the Critias by Plato. And realized that Poseidon was none other than Enki, who was running Atlantis in the north, in the in the Atlas mountain range where his island was. And this is very, very clearly detailed in one of the uh, the ancient Atlantic books that I got from Amherst Press in 1969. It was given to me by a friend from UCSD. It's, it's an amazing uh, depiction of how, connecting Enki to Atlantis and all his all his kids. He had ten kids there, and his chief. Uh, a king that he's named with Atlas, and the Atlas Mountains were named after him, and the Atlantic Ocean was named after him. Did so anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, they went to Greece, and both uh, Poseidon and Zeus had a temple there. Okay, and this is where our history of Western civilization starts. So I'm getting to the how this ties into New World Order. Okay. Um, according to the founding fathers here in this country. Um, we have clear predications in the city of Washington, D.C., and through the Masonic Order that the United States was designated as the new Atlantis, the new world headquarters. And we even commemorated this on our, on our currency in the back of the $1 bill. It says, Anuit Coeptus Order, a Novus Eclorum Order. Okay, so what that translates to mean is he approves of our undertakings. Well, who's the he that's being referred to? <laughs> Some high-level entity that's representative of a triangle on an unfinished disk on a pyramid. But we know where, these, where the symbology comes from. It comes from Egypt, which is Enki's domain, and it ties directly in with uh, that cast of characters that were on the Anunnaki Council. 